Kun was a shy man. It turned out that the rumor forming my sole image of him was false. It had been his grandmother who forced him to lie in bed, hoping that he was simply tired, using his eyes too much, that if he only rested them for long enough, he might be cured. By the time we are uh, married, a few years later, any sign of depression surrounding his condition was, was gone. The man I met was open-hearted and infuriatingly positive. <laughs> My opposite, in other words. I was uh, 15, he 19. We understood we had married to make life bearable for our families. On our wedding night, we lay down beside one, one another and left a courteous space between our bodies. I turned my face to the wall and he turned his to the room. I breathed shallowly, uh, sleeping with one foot in consciousness so I would not roll accidentally into his half of the bed. <laughs> For months, uh, the only part of us that touched were our hands when I took uh, when I took his to lead him through a particular narrow alley, when he forgot where he'd set a cup of tea, when I shifted a chair or a table while cleaning, and he could not find it. In his company, I, I soon learned not to fear being seen. I picked my nose, I let my face fall into grimace. I did not worry about the neatness of my hair, my clothes, my gait. It was uh, a kind of relaxation, like being alone without loneliness. I grew fond of this feeling and of him. When we did touch, my body responded involuntarily, producing uh, shivers of feelings that were once pleasant and unpleasant. Each, each time they shocked me so that I had to stop myself from snatching my hand back as if from a hot pan. Wickedly, I crave this feeling. I began to misplace things on purpose. You know, his walking stick, his teacup, his shoes. As I waited for him to discover the misplaced things, as I waited to touch him, I suffered a, a physical pain unlike any I had known before. It was a, an ache that could not be attributed to one joint or muscle, but was felt throughout the body. One day I decided to call this pain love. I was very happy with this, happy to have found a name for something and happy with how lucky I was to have fallen in love with the person I'd married. Tao Kun was too good to suspect me in his growing mindlessness. He, uh, he called me by my full name, not wife or woman, which made me feel like I was back in school. <laughs> Wonderful feeling. Zhu Wen, he said, what would I do without you? When he said this, it pleased me very much. At night, on my side of the bed, I fantasized in half sleep about my husband reaching over, his hand falling on my elbow, my shoulder, my knee. <laughs> if you ever needed to, and I hope you never need to, but a person cannot be sure. If you ever need to sleep, if you are ever so tired that you feel nothing but the animal weight of your bones and you're walking along a dark road with no one and you're not sure how long you've been walking and you keep looking down at your hands and not recognizing them and you keep catching a reflection in darkened windows and not recognizing that reflection and all you know is the desire to sleep and all you have is no place to sleep. One thing you can do is look for a church. What I know about churches is that they usually have many doors and often at least one of those doors late at night has been left unlocked. The reason churches have so many doors is that people tend to enter and leave churches and groups in a hurry. It seems people have a lot of reasons for entering a church and perhaps even more reasons for leaving one, but the only reason I've gone to a church was to sleep. The reasons I've left a church were to avoid being caught sleeping or because I'd already been caught sleeping and was being asked to leave. Those are the only reasons I can remember, though I'm having trouble lately with remembering. 
I left some place, began walking, slept in all those churches, then everything else happened. That's all I know. I don't think they're so great, churches. I, I don't think they're so great at all. That's not what I mean when I say you can go to one when you're tired. I'm not talking about grace or deliverance. A person cannot really speak of such things. What I mean is a church is a structure with walls and a roof and pretty windows that make it so you can't see outside. They're like casinos in that way, or shopping malls, or those big drug stores with all the aisles, music piped in from somewhere, the endless search for that final thing. But a church is also a building, often a sturdy building, and it can keep the outside far from you. And when the outside is far enough from you, that is when a person can sleep. One thing it seems that everybody needs is sleep. And one thing people might not always have when they need it is a place to sleep or enough time to travel to a place where they can sleep. And so a church, maybe a church will fix this problem for you someday, or maybe it already has. For some time, I only slept in churches. A few nights I tried to sleep in some woods or a bathroom stall or behind a gas station, and I took a few good naps in a cemetery, but the only place I could ever sleep for any real time back then was a church. Since then, I am not sure I've completely fallen asleep or woken up. Days and nights unspooled together. Sometimes I think I might be writing a letter to sleep that I might be asking him if he remembers me, if he ever plans on coming back. I've received no word from death's brother. I have not entered a church in some time. In large churches, that's the sort of church you'll wanna look for if you need sleep. The large churches have more doors that might be unlocked and more unlit spaces between all the buildings and rooms and hallways and playgrounds and gymnasiums and a kitchen or two. And sometimes they even have a smaller chapel next to the larger one and the smaller chapel is almost always left unlocked. Also, the people that go to a large church are often too various to agree about anything in particular. So if you're caught sleeping there, the person catching you will likely not have a clear idea about how to proceed with getting rid of you, whether to call the police or the pastor, or whether to give you something or take something from you. And people who are unsure of how to proceed are easy to escape. I've done this again and again. It seems that people who belong to a large church might want that church so vast, so many rooms, to do the believing for them. But the church is just a building. The church has no thoughts. The church is brick and glass. If they ever slept there, they would see that. The gods created the first temporary so they could take a break. Let there be some spare time, they said. And cover for us, won't you? Here are all of our passwords and credentials. Here is the key card. And here is a doohickey to clip the key card to your purse, see? Oh, sorry, here is a purse. Go on, fill it to the brim. Fill it a little more. Yes, it is supposed to be heavy. Here is your contract, and here is our copier, and here is the shared binder for all known manner of things. The first temporary fell from the husk of a meteor and glowed with no particular ambition. The gods had to pin her down so she would not float away, so distracted was this new kind of soul, so subject to drift. To be fair, they had not yet invented gravity. This was back when toads without occupation stored straight up to the clouds, back when employment was the only kind of honest weight you could apply to a life. The temporary spent her first day of work reading the shared binder for all known manner of things. 
She familiarized herself with each section, each document, birds, bees, mitochondria. She noted how overfull the binder was even then, even when the world was mostly long stretches of empty surface. What looked blank was actually cluttered with microscopic tendencies toward life. There were infinite itemizations to complete. If the world was already so stuffed, would there ever be room for the first temporary? The word placement meant something very different back then. It was not a job or a gainful assignment of employment. It was simply a place for each thing, a place to belong. The first temporary assigned placements for trees and sandy shores, for fossils and tassels. She wondered about her placement, its unsteadiness. Can I stay? Permanently, she asked, and the gods just laughed and went to lunch. At the end of the day, when the gods went to their god homes, the first temporary thought, what should I do now? The office had a smell that happened only at night. That's the smell of innovation, the gods had explained. She found one corner of the office that didn't smell so much and sat there for a while. It wasn't really an office, not the way most people today would picture an office. It was a collection of matter and inertia that suggested the sensation of work. She activated her key card and swiped herself into existence. A bird has flown into a window and lies dying on its back, Wallace discovers when he arrives at the Biosciences Building. The day is still cloudless, and the sky is an almost iridescent blue, the way it can be in late summer. The sight of the bird startles him. He has retained a fear of birds since childhood. This is one of those vague Midwestern birds, gray with a white belly. Its head is nearly crushed down inside its body and its long dark legs are like twigs from certain bushes. Occasionally, its wings spasm open. A thread of dark ants already stretches from a nearby bench to the bird, and Wallace knows without thinking too hard what will happen next. This reemergence of death in this immaculate city of the North, the suddenness of it jolts him almost as much as the bird itself. He cannot remember the last time he actually saw something die, not counting the worms he burns at the end of the titanium wire. How long has it been since he came across such a clear and present illustration of the order of things, of life ending, moving on? Long enough to have grown comfortable with death happening elsewhere, off in the margins. Or perhaps he's making too much of it, imbuing the moment with more significance than it warrants in the wake of all he told Miller about Alabama. How did his father look at the hour of his death or later at the funeral? Was he buried on a day like this? No, it must've been warmer, surely in Alabama at the height of the heat, the crying cicadas. Wallace breathes, turns, he hops up the steps and enters the building. Enough, he thinks. The familiar rattle of the machines greet him, and he relaxes. It's dry and cool indoors. He feels the humid tent of his sweater beginning to dry. He takes the elevator to the third floor, lets his fingers glide along the wooden railings as he walks past the balcony. Down below, a field of purple tiles depicting the molecular structures of various sugars and biomolecules. There's an error down there somewhere, a carbon with five bonds. A Texas carbon, they call it, after the points on the star of the flag of Texas. Someone pointed out to him during orientation and he strained to see it, squinting while the others merely laughed and shrugged. They didn't need to see the, to get the joke. Someone had to explain it to him later because five bonds on a carbon is impossible. He smiled, nodded, of course. A carbon can make four bonds, not more. He knew this, he had learned it in chemistry. He majored in chemistry at a small undergraduate institution in Alabama. His undergraduate research was in organic adduct reactions, trying to understand how and why molecules merge, become other molecules within the specific context of environmental chemistry. His advisor, a tall, wiry man with a long, slopping step and a mild tremor, was a respected, if minor, researcher in the field of acid rain. His work described a process, 
the slow accumulation of particles in the air that when combined become toxic or acidic, washing out of the sky into rivers and cities, destroying buildings and homes. Wallace's job in those days was to watch as his professor mixed various solutions in a slender capillary tube and stuck it in the machine to measure its spectra. It was beyond Wallace to understand such things then, but he was good at memorization and he took detailed notes. He was interested enough in science enough to know that it was his way out of the South for good. That day during orientation, when the tour guide told him about the Texas carbon, Wallace blinked slowly, dumbly. He had never heard of such a thing. The drawings from which he had learned chemistry had left no room for jokes or humor. It had never occurred to him that there could be five bonds on a carbon, even sarcastically. He had learned chemistry the way one learns French in school, too properly, too much by rote and routine, by memorizing all the rules, which of course is no way to learn a language that one intends to use. The lab door is already open and Wallace drops his bag at his desk. An email waits for him from Simone. He doesn't have to answer it. He doesn't have to read it, but he does, doesn't he? It's only a matter of time. Besides, if he doesn't answer this one, it'll be followed by another and another and another, a hail of emails falling down on him like knives until he eventually must. Beyond the window, the birds are gone. He bites the corner of his lip, opens the email, skims it. Among the responses to his last progress report flagged in red, two lines leap out at him. Let's talk, I'm worried. She thinks of the other direction, the hills where she was born and the sun that bleaches sky and brightens grass. She thinks about when she stood in a dead lake and held what men desired and died for. She thinks it was nothing really compared to the way the noonday sun makes the grass blaze, horizon to horizon a shimmer. Who could truly grasp it the huge and maddening glint, the ever shifting mirage, the grass that refused to be owned or pinned, but changed with every angle of light. What that land was and to whom, death or life, good or bad, lucky or unlucky, countless lives birthed and destroyed by its terror and generosity. And wasn't that the real reason for traveling? a reason bigger than poorness and desperation and greed and fury. Didn't they know, low in their bones, that as long as they moved and the land unfurled, that as long as they searched, they would forever be searchers and never quite lost. There is claiming the land, which Bao wanted to do, which Sam refused. And then there is being claimed by it. The quiet way, a kind of gift in never knowing how much of these heels might be gold. Because maybe if you only went far enough, waited long enough, held enough sadness pooled in your veins, soon you might come upon a path you knew. The shapes of rocks would look like familiar faces. The trees would greet you, buds and birdsong lilting up. And because this land had gouged in you an animal's kind of claiming, senseless to words and laws, dry grass drawing blood, a tiger's mark in a ruined leg, ticks and torn blisters, wind coarsened hair, sunburned in patterns to leave skin stripped or spotted. Then, if you run, you might hear yon the wind or welling up in your own parched mouth. Something like and unlike an echo coming from before and behind, the sound of a voice you've always known calling your name. She opens her mouth. She wants. Oh, no. wow, that's. Wow, I didn't, I, you completely got me off guard. Um, uh, thank you. 
after I said this sort of despicable thing about the randomness of awards, uh, I still appreciate the being the beneficiary of that randomness and um, yeah, and it does it does mean a lot actually. It's uh, it was a weird book. It was a really weird year to put any kind of book out, and I feel like I've already been so fortunate to have any readers at all and um, to get this nod from a. A, a library and a library that's that's meant so much to me uh it does mean it does mean a lot i'm like teaching right now like i'm about to like get off school and go teach a class and i've been thinking a lot about how um we think of writing as a very solitary activity um but it's actually just deeply deeply collaborative i also want to thank my agent um, jen awe and my my editors eric chinsky and emily bell and especially all the assistants that they've worked with through the years, uh, Jackson, Julia, um, Jessica, uh, Alexandra, Elizabeth. Um, I know the assistants do so much work and people in PR and marketing, I just, I know that not only is a book collaborative for a writer to write it, but there's so many people behind the scenes that make all these things happen. And I'm just so appreciative of everybody. And, um, and thank you so much.